Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by. Here it is, part two of the rebuttal of Amber Heard's allegations of abuse against Johnny Depp. If you haven't watched part one already, please make sure that you do. It will be linked down below. I've also made a video where I attempt to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Johnny Depp was in fact the victim of domestic abuse in the relationship. So do make sure to check that one out as well. So in part one, we stopped at the 15th of December, 2015. Today, we find ourselves on the day of Amber's 30th birthday party, which was held on the 21st of April, 2016, at the penthouse that she shared with Johnny at the time. Amber alleges that Johnny arrived late to her party in a drunken state and that a huge fight broke out after the guests left. Amber alleges that Johnny threw a magnum sized champagne bottle at the wall, shattered objects and glass, and violently assaulted Amber. Amber attached excerpts of her deposition regarding this incident as supporting evidence, marked exhibits 17 to 22. In her deposition, Amber is asked to go into more detail regarding this incident. One thing that really stands out to me is the ambiguity, inconsistency, and uncertainty of her evidence. Her answers to Johnny's lawyer are predominantly comprised of, I don't know, and I don't remember. For example, when she was asked about whether the champagne or wine bottle, it's referred to as champagne in her declaration and wine during her deposition, when asked about whether it broke or shattered, she said, I don't know. When asked about whether any glass shards touched her body, she fumbles and says that it touched her body, knees, and hands, and then backtracks and says, no, 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 not my hands. Generally speaking, when people are reliving a true incident, they don't tend to um and ah uh and think and stutter and backtrack and generally their recollection of the incident is flowing and smooth because they don't have to pause and think about it. If you watch Johnny's declaration of what happened to him in Australia, for example, it flows so smoothly out of his mouth. He doesn't need to stop and hesitate. I had to um, protect her at the time. And so I said that it was caught in the door, one of these, these huge accordion doors at this house. That wasn't the case at all. Um, she, she smashed, uh, she threw a vase, and then I got infections. I, I, I ended up with MRSA twice, so it was very complicated. I, I was trying to just get the finger back, you know, um, and and then deal with the insanity of having had my finger chopped off by, by this woman that I was married to. That is a sign of a witness who is telling the truth. Amber's delivery, however, is a classic sign that someone is not necessarily being truthful. She's also asked about whether she sustained any injuries as a result of the broken glass. Once again, she responds with, I don't know, or I don't think so, I don't remember. Now bear in mind that this deposition took place a mere four months after this incident. So this happened in April and the deposition took place in August. Amber was only 30 years old at the time, so she was quite young. So the fact that she can't remember details of such a key incident in her life, it was allegedly a huge fight with her husband on her birthday. She seemed to remember a few other details, but she forgot whether she was injured in any way. She remembered the champagne bottle was magnum sized, but she didn't remember if it shattered. It just all doesn't add up. Amber also alleged that Johnny broke a number of items in the kitchen and smashed paintings and statues. Once again, she failed to document any of this with photographic or video evidence. She even attests to this fact in her deposition. So aside from the complete lack of objective and independent evidence to support Amber's claims, we actually do have independent evidence that contradicts it. Kevin Murphy, who if you remember, was the estate manager of the penthouses at the time, stated in his deposition that he did not notice or see any noticeable damage to the property on the 21st of April. He was up in the apartment by the 22nd to examine the feces that was reported by Hilda, who was the housekeeper, and he didn't see any damage. On the topic of the feces that I just mentioned, notice how Amber conveniently left that out in her declaration. As you will remember from my Johnny Depp video, the first one that I released on this topic, on the morning of the 22nd of April, 
a large pile of feces was discovered on Johnny's side of the bed. Kevin Murphy states in his declaration that on the morning of the 22nd of April, he received a call from Hilda Vargas to inform him about this discovery. She followed up this phone call with sending pictures of the feces to Kevin Murphy. Mr. Murphy then went up to the penthouse and saw the feces with his own eyes, stating that it looked like human feces and that it was far too large to have been left behind by Amber's two tiny Yorkshire Terriers. Mr. Murphy further states that on the 12th of May of 2016, during a phone call that he had with Amber, she told him that it was just a harmless prank. As far as I'm concerned, this essentially means that she assumed responsibility for this, albeit as a prank. Another point I'd like to bring attention to is Amber's allegation that Johnny was in a drunken state when he arrived late to her party. In the deposition of Amber's best friend, Raquel Pennington, Raquel was asked about Johnny's demeanor during the party. Raquel testified that she spent around 35 minutes in the presence of Johnny after his late arrival. She was asked how he seemed and Raquel answered that he was pretty much his normal self and that nothing seemed amiss. Not once did she state that he was obviously drunk, as Amber alleges. Now, for the sake of being objective and playing devil's advocate, both Amber and Johnny did state that the fight broke out after the guests had left. So Raquel stating that nothing seemed amiss while she was in the apartment with the other guests doesn't necessarily disprove Amber's allegations. But it does specifically help in disproving her allegation that Johnny was in a drunken and altered state. We now move on to the final incident, which took place on the 21st of May of 2016. After a month of not seeing each other, Amber alleges that she and Johnny met up at their penthouse. Now Johnny states that he specifically went there to tell her that he was going to divorce her. But Amber never made mention of that. She alleges that Johnny's behavior was erratic and that he was inebriated and high. Whether these two things are the same, you can argue for and against. I just thought it was interesting that she decided to change her description of his behavior because if he was drunk and high, you would just say he was drunk and high. You wouldn't change it necessarily to erratic because someone can behave in an erratic manner without being under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Back to Amber's declaration, she alleges that he made her feel unsafe enough to text her friend Raquel and ask her to come over. Amber also claims that she called her other best friend, Io Tillett Wright, to help mollify Johnny or calm him down. Now this is code for gaslighting, but we'll touch more upon this point later on in the video. Amber goes on to state that at some point, Johnny became enraged, yelled at Io through the phone, before throwing the phone as hard as he could at Amber, hitting her squarely in the face. She then yelled out loud that Johnny hit her and she started to cry. She further alleges that Johnny grabbed her hair, slapped, shook, and yanked her around the room while she continued to scream. Amber attached excerpts from the transcript of her deposition as supporting evidence marked exhibits 23 and 24. She also attaches the video excerpt of her deposition marked exhibits 25 and 26. I remember it's in uh, screaming, uh, these expletives at my friend Io and telling her, um, that he, that she could have me now. And then he threw his arm back and he threw the phone, what okay. appeared to be very, as hard as he could at my face, put my head down. I said, you hit me. I was crying. I said, Johnny hit me because then I start hearing things being smashed. And I said to him, Honey, you hit, you hit me, you hit me in the eye, my eye, my eye. And I start crying and I, uh, he approaches me and I don't know um, if he, if I in here feeling him approach, uh, anticipate to try to get up or if I help him help me up or if he just did it all by grabbing my hair. but. For some reason, uh, I mean, I had some aid in getting up off the couch um, by h him grabbing my um, head, uh, mostly on my 
right side, like a, the impact of which was significant in and of itself. He grabs my, um, I don't know if he's trying to grab my face or if he's hitting my face or if, oh, I don't know what's happening, but he's- Bad performance. A few things stand out to me from this deposition. In exhibit 23, she says, it hits me, bam, right in the, what felt like the eye. Further down in the transcript, she says, and I don't know, it felt like my, it just felt like, um, it felt like my eye, or it could have been my eye, and I didn't, you know, um, what? I'm fairly certain that if something as hard as a phone was thrown at you with such force by a strong man, you would know exactly where it hit you, especially if it hit you in the eye, because the eye is such a vulnerable and fragile part of our face. It wouldn't be a matter of what felt like the eye. There is no gray area here. Did it hit you in the eye or didn't it? And again, all of those I don't knows and could have beens and maybes and ums and ahs just really stand out to me as fabrication. As further supporting evidence, Amber attached photos of the alleged injuries that she sustained, marked exhibit 33. She also attached a screenshot of a text conversation that took place between her and her friend Melanie that same night. The same argument that I applied to the other text messages in my first video apply to this one, which is just because you said something in a message to your friend, that in no way proves your allegations as fact. As for the photographs, we will dismantle them thoroughly a little later on. Another major point of inconsistency is whether Amber yelled out to Io over the phone to call 911. In paragraph 13 of her original declaration, dated the 27th of May, 2016, Amber stated, I then yelled, call 911, hoping it would be heard by Io, who was still on the phone. In her most up-to-date declaration, dated the 10th of April, 2019, she completely leaves out this part. During her deposition in August of 2016, Johnny's lawyer asked Amber if it's true that she yelled out at Io to call 911. Amber responds that she didn't remember yelling that out. Johnny's lawyer then attempts to refresh her memory and refers to the exact paragraph and page number of the statement. And only then does Amber say, yeah, then, then I said that. This was taken immediately after and it's been a while. So this is her excusing her bad memory, even though the deposition took place less than three months after this incident. The same argument that I applied earlier about her poor memory applies here. How could a young person of only 30 years old claim to not remember such important and traumatic details? I just find it incredibly difficult to believe that she wouldn't remember these details. She remembers the more minor ones, but she seems to have issues remembering anything significant. In my opinion, she didn't remember because she lied. Now in Johnny's declaration, when he specifically refers to this incident of the 21st of May, he states that Amber and Io both told him that the feces incident never happened and that he was obsessing over something that was essentially a figment of his imagination. This is called gaslighting. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not gonna go deeply into the definition, but it's basically when you make your victim question their own reality and you make them feel like they're crazy. So what Johnny did was he called up Kevin Murphy that same night as Amber and Io were gaslighting him to verify the story. Amber completely leaves out this part of the incident, the phone call with Kevin Murphy, out of her declaration. So in her 2019 declaration, she makes no mention of the feces incident, but in her 2016 declaration, she alludes to it by stating that Johnny suddenly began obsessing about something that was untrue. Because Io and Amber were gaslighting Johnny about the incident and telling him that he was imagining it, we can put two and two together and very safely assume that she was referring to the feces incident. In paragraph 11 of Amber's 2016 declaration and paragraph three of Io's declaration, they both state that Johnny was very upset over something he thought someone had done to him. So we actually have cold hard evidence of the fact that they were gaslighting him. Luckily for Johnny though, he had Kevin Murphy to back him up. Both Kevin and Johnny state in their declarations that Amber became enraged when Kevin Murphy verified Johnny's claims over the phone. He essentially repeated what Amber had told him on the 12th of May, which is that it was just a harmless prank. 
Amber then started to scream and verbally abuse Mr. Murphy over the phone, which prompted him to hang up. Mr. Murphy further states that Johnny called him later to apologize for Amber's behavior and for putting him in the middle of his marital affairs. Mr. Murphy also said that Johnny was lucid, calm, and sober, and seemed sad and tired as opposed to angry. This is in direct contradiction to Amber's allegations that Johnny was furious and erratic. Both Amber and Raquel state that Amber sent a text to Raquel at 8.06 p.m. to tell her that Johnny was going crazy and that Amber was feeling unsafe. What both of them failed to do, however, is to provide evidence of this text message. Maybe it's out there, maybe I couldn't find it, but it was definitely not included as exhibits in any of their declarations. This stands out as odd to me because they've provided plenty of text messages as evidence before. And now when the text message is actually a fact in issue, they haven't provided it. This is important because Johnny alleges in his declaration that Raquel was actually hiding somewhere in the penthouse already in penthouse three, as opposed to being in her own penthouse, which she lived in for free, by the way, with her then fiance, Josh. In fact, when you really look at Raquel's declaration side by side with Amber's, in some aspects, specifically with regards to this incident of the 21st of May, Raquel's declaration is almost word for word what Amber stated in her declaration. This to me stands out as one of the first and most obvious signs that the witnesses have corroborated their stories and that there is some form of conspiring going on behind the scenes where, you know, they're meeting up and they're making sure that their stories are lined up and that they're saying the exact same thing, which ironically enough is the first giveaway that you're lying. I'm not in any way saying that witness testimony can't be similar because the truth is the truth. There's only so much that you can deviate from it when you're explaining it. But the word for word verbatim is absolutely suspicious. And it really makes me doubt the veracity of both of their claims. And then again, in Raquel's deposition, which took place in July of 2016, she almost repeats the exact words that she used in her declaration, which points to a rehearsed witness. Now you have to remember that Ayo was on the phone the entire time. So everything that he heard was everything that Amber wanted him to hear. If you recall from my first video on this topic, Johnny stated in his declaration that once he told Ayo that he was gonna divorce Amber and that it was over, he flung the phone onto the couch, which was around four feet away from where Amber stood. He then walked away from Amber towards the kitchen island, which was 20 feet away from where she was. At that point, Amber had started to shriek into the phone that Johnny had hit her which prompted Johnny's security guards, Jerry Judge and Sean Bett, to run into the apartment. They are witnesses and have testified to the fact that Johnny was nowhere near Amber as she was screaming that he was hitting her. Now, I'm not defending Ayo in any way because he is clearly a liar who is complicit in Amber's hoax. I'm just trying to be objective here and give him the benefit of the doubt because he didn't see anything. He wasn't there. All he could hear was what Amber was shrieking on the phone. So as far as he was concerned, Johnny could have actually been hitting her. Okay, are you there right now, ma'am? No, I'm downstairs. Okay, and I'm sorry, you said 840, was it North or South Broadway? Uh, I don't know, it's Eastern Building, downtown LA. Somebody was being physically assaulted? Yeah. A woman, who was hurting her? A man. Is that her boyfriend? 20, 20, I am a man. That's all I know. Did you witness it? No, I happen to know that it's happening, Saturday, and I just need May, to remain anonymous. 20, okay, you can remain anonymous, 20, 20, then, but I have to be certain 16, what's going on. How do you know this is 20, going on, though? 20, uh, she told me. 20, oh, okay, so this is a friend seconds. of yours? Yeah. Okay, so what did she say, that this guy was assaulted her or hit her? Physically assaulting her, yeah. Okay, but this isn't a boyfriend or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's... 20, it could be, 20, yeah. Eight and okay, is it her boyfriend, yes or no? Seconds. Yes. Okay, seconds. and I'm sorry, what was the suite number? Penthouse 3. Penthouse 3, okay. And uh, your friend, did she relay this information to you via text or were you 20, talking to her? 20, 20, uh, and okay. 17. What's her name? May 20, Her name, 2, Amber. 2016. That's 20, all I can 20, tell you, I have to go. And 20, okay, well, if that's all we have and we can't talk to her... her 
there's not much we can do. So we'll send what do you mean up. there's send somebody up, please? I'm going to send someone uh, send someone up, ma'am. But you know, if we get up there and she denies it or okay, 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 just so you know, okay, so we're coming out here. to eight four zero Broadway, Penthouse Three, okay, the eight four nine. This call wasn't even made by Io. Rather, it was made by an unidentified female who, to me, suspiciously sounds a lot like Raquel Pennington. Notice the affect or the tone of this female's voice as she was talking to the police. She sounds calm and aloof, almost detached and uninterested, even a little bit annoyed. Most certainly not the tone of someone who was fearful for their friend's life. Especially when you consider the fact that the call was placed almost two hours after Johnny had left. So obviously Amber wasn't in any imminent danger. All right, now for the allegations of the immense destruction that Johnny allegedly left in his wake. Both Amber and Raquel allege that Johnny caused extensive damage to Penthouse 3 and 5 that night. Amber attached an excerpt from her deposition marked Exhibit 27 and photographic evidence of the damage marked Exhibit 28 as supporting evidence. This is where we start to dismantle her and her friend's claims. Two domestic abuse trained officers responded to the phone call that was placed at 10.07 p.m. and arrived at the penthouse at around 10.24 p.m. Both officers swept through both properties, penthouse three and five, and conducted an examination of Amber's face and body on two separate occasions that night. They both testified that they did not see any damage caused to the property whatsoever, and nor did they see any injuries on Amber's face and body. Additionally, the officers both testified that Amber was uncooperative and refused to give them any information. Now, I do have to say that it's not unheard of for victims to refuse to cooperate with the police out of fear of retribution or vengeance from their abuser. But that is clearly not the case here. And I'll tell you why. Fear of retribution usually takes place when the abuser is present as the authorities are questioning the victim or they're nearby or the victim knows that they're going to go home to them or if the victim feels that they're stuck with them because they have nowhere else to go. They may have small children together, the victim may be completely financially dependent on the abuser, and so many other reasons. All of which do not apply to Amber's situation. Firstly, Johnny had long gone. He wasn't lingering there. She was also a working and relatively successful Hollywood actress at the time who had her own income. So she was capable of being independent and of sustaining herself. Now I've mentioned Kevin Murphy before, but since we are beginning to officially dismantle the evidence, I do want to reiterate the fact that he stated in his declaration that he did not see any damage whatsoever to the property or injuries to Amber after this incident. Now we move on to the days between this incident and Amber's famous appearance outside the courthouse after she had applied for a restraining order against Johnny on the 27th of May of 2016. She was somber looking, clad in black from head to toe, and apparently completely makeup free. Or so we thought. You'll remember that the two responding domestic violence police officers testified under oath that they did not observe any injuries on Amber's face on the night of the 21st. But they weren't the only witnesses who saw Amber face to face on the days that had elapsed between the 21st and the 27th. Our first witness is a neighbor and a tenant of Johnny's, Isaac, and I'm gonna butcher his last name because I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Barak, Barich, I'm really sorry, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm gonna call him Isaac. He's known Johnny for 36 years and he lived on the same floor as Amber and Johnny at the time. He stated that when he saw Amber face to face on May 22nd, May 23rd, May 24th, and a day or two after the 24th, he wasn't sure which day, he did not see any visible bruises, marks, or cuts to her face. According to Isaac, she did not appear to be wearing any makeup and the lighting was bright. He saw her in close proximity as they were having conversations. It wasn't just a passing by in the hallway. Secondly, 
the testimony of three building staff who worked at the Eastern Columbia building. We start off with the testimony of Trinity Esparza, who owns the concierge and the security company that runs the Eastern Columbia building. Mrs. Esparza saw Amber the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday following the 21st of May. She testified that Amber did not have any visible cuts or bruises to her face up until the 27th of May, when the bruise seemingly appeared out of nowhere. She also testified to asking two other employees, Alex Romero and Cornelius Harrell, whether they had noticed any bruises on her face prior to the 27th, and they had both answered her in the negative. Mrs. Esparza further testified to seeing Amber completely injury and bruise free on CCTV security footage. Furthermore, Mrs. Esparza testifies to having witnessed Amber's sister Whitney playfully punch her in the elevator on the 24th of May, 2016. Raquel Pennington was also there and the three of them laughed. Mrs. Esparza was so taken aback by Amber's mysterious bruise on the 27th that she went back and reviewed security footage around 10 to 15 times because she couldn't put two and two together. The timeline and Amber's allegations just didn't add up in her mind. Upon reviewing this footage, Mrs. Esparza confirmed that Amber did not have any visible bruises to her face prior to the 27th of May, 2016. I mentioned two other building employees and they have both also provided testimony in relation to this. Cornelius Harrell, who worked as a concierge in the building, interacted with Amber in person on the 22nd of May, which was a Saturday and the day after the incident in question. He testified to not seeing any injuries or bruises to her face and that she appeared very refreshed and did not appear to have any makeup on. He also reviewed security footage of her from that day and once again verified that he could not see any bruises or injuries to her face. Our next witness is Alex or Alejandro Romero. Mr. Romero testified that he saw Amber the following Monday or Tuesday. He wasn't sure which, but he stated that she looked normal with no cuts or bruises to her face. She was barely three or four feet away from him during their interaction and their surroundings were very well lit. He also stood next to her in the same elevator that day, barely two to three feet away from her and again, did not see any injuries to her face. He reviewed security footage that was recorded during the days leading up to the 27th and did not detect any injuries, bruising or marks on Amber's face. Finally, we have Samantha McMillan, who if you'll remember, I referred to in my previous video. She was with Amber on the day of the James Corden show on the 16th of December of 2015, and she had testified that Amber was completely injury free. Well, guess what? She was once again with Amber on the 24th of May, 2016, and she testified that she interacted closely with Amber. She states that Amber was not wearing any makeup and that there were no visible marks, bruises, cuts, or injuries to her face or any other part of her body. When she saw Amber's bruise on the news on the 27th of May, she states that she knew Johnny had left LA on the 22nd of May. So she surmised that there was no way that Johnny could have been responsible for these bruises since he wasn't even in LA to begin with. And with that, we have arrived to the end of dismantling Amber's allegations of abuse against Johnny Depp. It took us two videos to do it because there is just that much evidence and so much more out there that I couldn't get my hands on that completely tears apart her story. When I made Johnny's video, it was a brief one because it was so clear cut, so direct, so smooth, so easy to prove that 
all of his allegations were true. It took me two videos and weeks of research, honestly, to break apart Amber's lies because there is just that much evidence against her. That's it for this video. I honestly hope I've delivered. I've really dedicated a lot of time and effort to making sure that I touch upon every single relevant piece of information. If you feel like I've left out something that you think is relevant, do let me know. But bear in mind that I've mentioned this before, as per my profession, I've left aside any unnecessary information that is not a material fact to this case. I really hope you found this video informative. I hope it addresses all the relevant points. And thank you so much for your support and for your encouragement. I wouldn't have made these videos if they weren't so highly requested and if it wasn't for the support that I received from my previous videos. So thank you so much, really. It means so much to me. Now, obviously I'm not done with making videos on this case because it is an ongoing case and I will keep releasing updates as they come. Another video that I will be making very soon is kind of, I guess, a prediction video or an analysis rather, rather than a prediction of whether Johnny Depp has a strong case for defamation against Amber. So we'll be looking closely at defamation and the elements that are required to be satisfied in order for Johnny to be victorious in court. So make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. This is definitely just the start of a lot more content to come in relation to this ongoing case.